So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's lecture from Dr. Valerie Hibert. This, uh, this lecture is in support of uh, the recent traveling exhibit at the Thunder Bay Museum titled, And in 1948, I came to Canada, a Holocaust in six dates, which is um, provided by the Montreal Holocaust Museum, which was developed with funding from the government of Canada. I'm Scott Bradley. I'm the executive director of the Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society. And I'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging the original custodians of this land and pay my respects to the elders past, present and future for they hold the memories, the traditions and the culture and hopes of indigenous peoples. We also recognize that we are meeting on the traditional land of Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850 and to acknowledge the role of the Métis settlement in the development of our community. A bit of housekeeping for everyone. Um, so tonight um, I have a head cold and Dr. Hibert um, is recently recovering from an illness as well. So if you hear us cough or um, kind of drone out for a second, um, just know that we're taking a strategic pause and we'll get back to the presentation as soon as we recover. Um, so bear with us um, with all that in mind. Um, we are doing this uh, lecture tonight in Zoom's webinar format, so your microphones and video have been turned off, and at no time can we see you or the contents of your screen nor hear you. Um, we will have time for questions and, and answers at the end of the presentation, so please do use the Q&A function or the chat box during the presentation um, to enter in your questions, and we'll work through those as we get to the end. So now I would like to introdu introduce Dr. Valerie Hubert, who is an Associate Professor of History and Interdisciplinary Studies at Lakehead University, Aurelia, where she teaches on modern European history, Nazi Germany, and the Holocaust, and the photography of human rights violations and international conflict. She's won fellowships for the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, Hebrew University, and the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She has published on the Nuremberg Trials, Rwanda's Gakeksha Tribunals, and the German resistance figure Kurt Gerstein, and the Holocaust photography. In 2020, she was awarded the SSHRC Insight Grant for the book project Five Shots from Subanau. You can correct me on that after we get done. Uh, photograph photographs of the Holocaust by Bullets, 1942. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Hubert, thank you so much for being here tonight and uh, I will turn over the microphone to you. Thank you so much, Scott. And uh, thank you for the invitation um, from you and from the Thunder Bay Museum to uh, speak with you tonight. Um, the timing of this event is fitting at sundown. Uh, Yom HaShoah begins, which is the uh, Holocaust uh, Memorial Day. The Traveling exhibit uh, to which this talk is connected um, is intended to bring uh, awareness to the genocide of the Jews and to provoke discussion around the impact of racism and discrimination in our society. And I'm glad to be able to contribute uh, to that mission. The exhibit, as Scott mentioned, was um, Oh, I also wanted to recognize the support of the Sharei Shemayim um, congregation in making both uh, the exhibit possible as well as the programming that's uh, connected to that exhibit. Um, this exhibit, as Scott mentioned, was created by the Montreal Holocaust Museum many years ago. It feels like uh, a lifetime ago. Uh, when I was a student at McGill, I volunteered uh, with the museum. I was part of their Witness to History um, uh, program. And for that, I interviewed Holocaust survivors to create a video archive of oral testimonies. Those men and women were among the minority of European Jews who had survived the Nazi onslaught. They came to Canada after the war. They rebuilt their lives, established families, and uh, rebuilt a community. The truth, though, is that they were not welcome in our country while their lives were threatened. So tonight I'll be speaking about Canada's pre-war and wartime response to the Jewish refugee crisis. I'm going to share my screen.
Now, although I'll be moving back in time very shortly, I want to begin by um, having us think about current events. Today, the war in Ukraine entered its 63rd day. <clears throat> I'm sure we've all seen the footage and photographs of crowds of Ukrainian civilians pouring onto trains and across borders on foot, fleeing the danger at home. We believe 5.3 million Ukrainians have left their country while another 7.7 .7 million are displaced within it. They fled to bordering countries, Poland, uh, Moldova, Romania, onto Slovakia, Hungary, then further on still to Italy, Scandinavia, France, Germany, and also the US and Canada. I'm sure you've seen images uh, like these. This is a shot from uh, the Polish border where Ukrainian uh, refugees are being received with, with food. This shows the platform at a train station uh, in Poland where Polish families left baby strollers uh, in anticipation of, of young families arriving. 90% of Ukrainian refugees are women and children. This is another image <clears throat> showing crowds of Ukrainians boarding uh, a humanitarian train that would leave Poland, leave Krakow and uh, headed for Berlin. And this is a photograph showing the, a train station in Berlin where ordinary German people uh, came to meet one of these trains carrying uh, Ukrainian refugees and held up signs offering places in their homes for Ukrainians to take shelter. Shortly after the invasion of Ukraine, the Canadian government enacted the Canada-Ukraine Authorization for Emergency travel program. This was done to help Ukrainians uh, come to Canada as quickly as possible and to provide them with the ability to work and study here until uh, such time that it is safe to uh, return home. According to Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, we've received over 163,000 applications from Ukrainian nationals and as of April 19th, just a little over a week ago, we've approved of over 56,000 applications. A very close friend of mine uh, was able to complete the paperwork for cousins of hers that uh, fled Ukraine. And within weeks, they were cleared to make their arrangements to come to Toronto. We've sent military equipment, we've sent uh, volunteers to uh, work with humanitarian organizations, we've sent financial donations. My town is flying a Ukrainian flag in the, in the park. Perhaps you'll remember too, our response to the Syrian refugee crisis, the 2015 photograph of the um, lifeless body of three-year-old Alan Kurdi lying dead on a beach in Turkey galvanized our resolve around this issue. Since then, 73,000 Syrians have made their home here. There's a Scandinavian, <clears throat> excuse me, there's the coughing starting. <clears throat> there's a Scandinavian saying that I think is applicable in both its literal and metaphorical sense. It goes, where there is room in the heart, there is room in the house. Political crises test the strength of our moral convictions. Canada's record on refugee crises in the 20th century shows us that we have sometimes wavered when put to that test. In November 2018, Prime Minister Trudeau formally apologized for Canada's refusal to accept German Jewish refugees who had set sail from Hamburg in May 1939. He declared, we are sorry for the callousness of, German, of Canada's response we are sorry for not apologizing sooner. He was referring to the voyage of the St. Louis. In May 1939, 907 German Jews set sail from Hamburg aboard this uh, ship. The passengers were all formerly well-to-do and successful, but they had been dispossessed of their property and businesses and were now desperate to leave Europe. They had entrance visas for Cuba, one of the few places left that would uh, offer them safe haven. However, when they reached Cuba at the end of the month, 
the government there refused to recognize these visas and the helpless Jews were not allowed to disembark from the ship. Various Jewish organizations lobbied several South American countries, they all refused. And so their last hope was to be allowed to land in the US and Canada. And so the ship sailed north. The American reply to their plea was to send out a gunboat to escort them up the coast to ensure that they would neither try to land nor that any of its passengers would attempt to swim to shore. Several influential Canadians, including the former president of the University of Toronto, Robert Faulkner, wrote personally to Prime Minister Mackenzie King and pleaded with him to allow these refugees uh, into Canada. King left it to his subordinates and they flatly refused. Frederick Charles Blair, the director of Canada's immigration branch from 1936 to 1943 replied that these refugees <clears throat> did not meet immigration regulations and Canada had already done quote unquote too much for the Jews. He added quote, no country could open its doors wide enough to take in the hundreds of thousands of Jews who want to leave Europe. The line must be drawn somewhere. The ship and its passengers returned to Europe. Ultimately, they were allowed to disembark in Britain, Holland and Belgium, but those who returned to the continent of Europe were later deported and murdered in the death camps of Poland. The story of the St. Louis is emblematic of the period. In the 1930s, Hitler and the Nazis had embarked upon a program of making lives for Jews in Germany unlivable. Many Jews decided to leave, many more uh, would have liked to and couldn't. The Nazis imposed hefty uh, fines and exit taxes. They wouldn't issue German passports. They essentially made their nationals uh, stateless and without a passport, Jews could not show that they had a home to return to. So even pleas for temporary shelter were treated with suspicion. As more and more Jews were added to the Reich as the result of Nazi territorial gains, the refugee situation reached crisis proportions. Fewer and fewer countries were willing to accept Jews and the Jews were uh, themselves increasingly desperate to find new homes. The St. Louis is so tragic because this was one rare occasion where nearly a thousand Jews could have been saved. They had gotten out of Germany and they had thought they found a place to accept them. And then at the last moment, the gate slammed shut. Forced back to Europe, they met the same, many of them met the same fate as those who had never left. <clears throat> In Trudeau's 2018 apology, he declared, quote, bitter resentment towards Jews were enshrined in our policies. What did he mean? So in the rest of our time, I'd like to delve into two questions. First, what Canada's response to the refugee crisis was in more detail. And then secondly, what factors shaped that response? <clears throat> Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933. Although he talked about eliminating the Jews, he used that kind of language, solving once and for all the quote unquote uh, Jewish question. In the early years of his regime, this did not necessarily mean murder. Pre-war anti-Jewish legislation aimed at identifying Jews, uh, pushing them further and further to the fringes of German society, stripping them of their legal rights and severing ties between them and their German neighbors. This included the boycotting of businesses, placing quotas on their numbers um, in the civil service, in the professions and schools from primary right through to university. These quotas later moved to outright exclusion, stripping them of their uh, citizenship, <clears throat> and the rights that went along with that, the Aryanization, quote unquote, Aryanization of their property, limiting their presence in public spaces, on transit and shops and businesses. Although uh, physical violence was not uncommon, it was not yet an end in itself. <clears throat> the goal of these pre-war policies was to intimidate Jews, to force them out of the Reich. Right? So this produced a refugee 
crisis. And then as the Reich expanded, for example, with the annexation of Austria and later um, the annexation of parts of Czechoslovakia, more Jews were added to uh, Nazi authority and the crisis only grew. So this is an important uh, point. So although the Nazis placed obstacles in the way, um, in those pre-war years, they were still allowing Jews to leave. And about 300,000 Jews did get out of Germany. They went to Britain, France, Belgium, Holland, US, Australia, South America, and yes, also to Canada. In the 1930s, Canada accepted 4,000 Jews. During the war years, 39 to 45, we accepted 500. So for the whole period of the Nazi regime, we took in about 4,500 Jews. How does this compare? <clears throat> Argentina took in 22,000. China, 15,000. Britain, 85,000. Palestine, 100,000. And the United States, 161,000. Canada at that time had about a tenth of the population of the US if we had accepted refugees in the same proportion as uh, America, we would have taken in 16,000 Jews. So put another way, we took in proportionally a quarter as many uh, Jewish refugees as our neighbors to the South. In the 1930s, Canada had a restrictive immigration policy. This was <clears throat> related uh, to the depression. It wasn't entirely defined by the depression, but it was connected to it. In 1933, a third of wage earners were unemployed. During this time of economic crisis, immigration was limited mainly to white people <clears throat> from the British Commonwealth and the US who had the means to establish and maintain themselves on farms. Therefore, during the 1930s, allowing Jewish refugees in would have meant making an exception to an already established policy. So restrictionists, those who were in favor of tightening immigration policies such as it was, had the advantage. So what were Canada's responses to specific proposals? <clears throat> One of the first requests came in 1934. The League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees approached Prime Minister Bennett and asked him to take a number of German refugees. This, this was not entirely um, a group of German Jews. There were Jews among this refugee population from Germany, and they numbered in the hundreds, not thousands. But immigration authorities persuaded Bennett that any exceptions to existing policy would only lead to more, right? They used that thin edge of the wedge argument. If we let some in now, more will demand entry later, and it'll be harder to go back on a precedent once it's set. Prompted by the worsening refugee crisis in July, 1938, President Roosevelt called an international conference in the small French resort town of Evian. Canada was incredibly reluctant even to attend for fear of being publicly pressured into accepting uh, more Jews. But it soon became clear that this was all simply an exercise in public relations of the 32 nations that attended the conference, only the Dominican Republic was willing to uh, commit to accepting a substantial number of Jews. Other countries simply stated that they would fill existing quotas, that is that they were not willing to expand any or extend any existing policy. Years after the meeting, the concierge of the host hotel was interviewed about his memories of this conference. He said, <clears throat> Very important people were here and all the delegates had a nice time. They took pleasure cruises on the lake. They gambled at the casino. They took mineral baths and massages. Some of them took the excursion to Chamonix to go summer skiing. Some went riding. We have, you know, one of the finest stables in France. Some played golf. We have a beautiful course overlooking the lake. 
Meetings, yes, some attended meetings, but of course it is difficult to sit indoors hearing speeches when all the pleasures that Evian offers are waiting right outside. <clears throat> I'm showing you here an editorial cartoon that appeared in the New York Times. It's referring to the uh, Evian crisis and it sums up the stakes of the issue so very clearly. You see at the center seated uh, a non-Aryan and the signpost is telling him to go in any direction. Of course, he's sitting in at the uh, crossroads of what is a swastika and at the end point of each of those uh, possible paths is the word stop. And then on the horizon is this you know, beacon of the Evian crisis. So only the, the Dominican Republic stepped up with a willingness to accept Jews, Canada, uh, was relieved to see that it would, was not alone in refusing to extend its immigration policy. The next big test came only a few months later in November. On the night of the uh, 9th of November, the Nazi state led a nationwide pogrom attacking Jews. They burned uh, synagogues. Uh, vandalized homes, <clears throat> smashed the windows of shops and businesses. Kristallnacht, the literal translation is Crystal Night. It um, obtained that name to refer to all the glass that littered the street the night after this, uh, this outburst of violence. Jews were beaten, uh, thousands upon thousands were arrested, some were killed. And Kristallnacht, was no secret. It shocked the Western world and there were outpourings of condemnation of the Nazis. There were outpourings of sympathy for the Jews in cities across internationally, but also in Canada. There were demonstrations and mass meetings, resolutions, uh, pleading with the government to open its doors. 20,000 marched in Toronto, 4,000 in Winnipeg. Newspapers from across Canada except the French press in Quebec called for a more generous policy towards refugees. Jewish leaders met with Prime Minister Mackenzie King. He had replaced Bennett in 1935 and they suggested, they brought to him a proposal to accept 10,000 refugees over five years. And they promised that all of them would be the responsibility of the Jewish community. None of them would ever become public charges. They promised that none of them would settle in Quebec. I'm going to return in a few minutes to this sensitivity around uh, Quebec. Now, in receipt of this proposal, the Department of Immigration, which was part of the um, Ministry of Mines and Resources, um, the head of the Ministry of Mines and Resources, Thomas Crerar, received this proposal and was initially in favor of it. King too was sympathetic to the plight of the Jews. But ultimately it went nowhere. Uh, King declared that there had to be provincial agreement on the issue. That is, he wanted the provinces to volunteer to accept refugees and he would impose no federal decision upon them. So the final decision was that there would be no change to current regulations. The only softening was that officials were instructed to interpret existing policy as liberally as possible. Essentially, Jews who were in Canada, who had landed as tourists, would be allowed to remain. But refugees would be kept out, continue to be kept out. It should be noted that around this same time, the cabinet uh, did agree to accept some Czech and Sudeten Germans, ethnic Germans, non-Jewish ethnic Germans into Canada. Six months after this <clears throat> was the doomed voyage of the St. Louis about which uh, I spoke just a few minutes ago. And again, that event demonstrates the continuing rigidity of Canadian immigration policy. So what happened after the war began when refugees were an even, an, in an even more vulnerable and dangerous position? The course of the war uh, shocked Canadians. France, Holland, Belgium fell in a matter of weeks. 
you know, France held Germany off in four years, you know, it was only a generation ago that the Great War had, had been fought and uh, France had been able to hold the line for all that time and then uh, collapsed so quickly under the uh, Nazi assault. And so there was an enormous fear of Germany. There was this idea that perhaps France had been weakened from within by a so-called you know, fifth column, a group working for the enemy within uh, France's borders. And many feared that any refugees that might come to Canada, if they had still relatives in Germany, they might spy for their home country, that is their, their uh, national sympathies were suspect. But even over and above this, refugees, because they were still in theory German nationals, refugees from the expanded German Reich were still German nationals. Um, once the war began, they became enemy aliens and were forbidden entry to Canada. And this more or less uh, sealed the fate of Europe's Jews. There was one last opportunity that presented itself in 1942 when France was uh, conquered in June 1940. Um, Germany occupied, but only a part of the country. Another <clears throat> section came under administration of a French collaborationist uh, government called the Vichy regime. And during the summer of 1942, the Vichy regime rounded up 42,000 Jews to be handed over to Germany. Um, however, children, of these uh, families that had been scooped up, children aged two to 15 were not immediately sent away and 5,000 were languishing in French internment camps, orphaned. Western governments were approached by various humanitarian groups to take them in. And at the end of September, the US took in several thousand. In Canada, Thomas Prerar, who was the head of the Ministry of Mines and Resources, you know, in which the Department of Immigration was housed, he agreed to allow in uh, 500 of these children plus another 500 later with conditions. They were to remain only for the duration of the war. They were not to be adopted by Canadian families. They would only be fostered and then returned to Europe uh, once hostilities ended. And Jewish groups were told very clearly not to ask for any more. The project never actually materialized because the Nazis, uh, given the um, developments in the war, the Nazis ended up uh, occupying the rest of France and the uh, plan fell apart. However, this offer that Canada had made to accept 500 children now, 500 later was still, so to speak, on the table. And at that time there were 250 Jewish children in Spain and Portugal. <clears throat> and Canada was asked if it would take these children without their parents. Blair refused because <clears throat> the Blair was uh, the head of the immigration branch. branch. <clears throat> he refused because these children were not actually orphans. He believed that to allow the children in would give uh, their parents uh, justification to try and enter the uh, Canada at the end of the war. So what was Canada's response to the Jewish refugee crisis? Well, opportunity after opportunity, the answer was no, no, no. The Canadian government did not speak with a single voice on this. In July, 1943, the MP representing Winnipeg, Stanley Knowles said this in the House of Commons. As human beings, we should do our best, provide as much, much sanctuary as we can for those people who can get away. I say we should do that because these people are humans and deserve that consideration. And because we are human <clears throat> and ought to act in that way. These words didn't sway policy. Now, why did Canada do so little? There were many factors from the very direct, uh, finite, you know, the, the decisions of individual bureaucrats to the very broad things like national attitudes towards international obligations. And I think it's, it's helpful to think of these many factors as um, concentric circles, right? And so in, in describing these 
<clears throat> various factors, I'll start with the center and move outward. And what I want to try and show you is that it was all these factors together that account for Canada's response to the refugee crisis. And each one of these factors was influenced by a broader climate of, of thinking and practice. So closest to the problem was <clears throat> the Canadian director of the immigration branch, a man called Frederick Charles Blair. He made almost all the decisions about who got into Canada and he was a narrow-minded <clears throat> anti-Semitic bureaucrat. He did things exactly by the book with no deviation, no exception. He was proud of having been able to stem the tide of Jewish refugees. He said, quote, pressure on the part of Jewish people to get into Canada has never been so greater, has never been greater than it is now. And I am glad to be able to add after 35 years experience here that it was never so well controlled. He saw Jews as distasteful, as incapable of assimilating, as disruptive to society. He declared in a letter to a fellow opponent of Jewish immigration, this. <clears throat> I suggested recently to three Jewish gentlemen with whom I am very well acquainted that it might be a very good thing if they would call a conference and have a day of humiliation and prayer when they would honestly try to answer the question of why they are so unpopular everywhere. I often think that instead of persecution, it would be far better if we more often told them frankly why many of them are unpopular. If they would <clears throat> divest themselves of certain of their habits, I am sure that they would be just as popular in Canada as our Scandinavians. At the same time, <clears throat> although Blair wielded enormous influence over, Im <clears throat> over immigration, we can't lay all the blame for Canada's response to the Jewish refugees at his feet. In the end, he was a bureaucrat and he reflected the wishes of his superiors and they ultimately were responsible for government policy. Refusal to accept Jewish refugees was a political decision, right? Not exclusively a bureaucratic one. And so then widening our perspective, we look also at the role and influence of uh, prime minister. The time for most of the, of the time that we're thinking about uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King. We read his diary during these years for indications about his attitudes towards uh, the issue and what one notes is a certain ambivalence uh, towards both Nazi Germany and uh, Jews. In March 1938, he praises the Nazi revolution. He described aspects of the Nazi movement as, quote, bringing the world into finer order. Regarding Jewish refugees, he wrote, nothing is to be gained by creating an internal problem in an effort to meet an international one. Say that again, nothing is to be gained by creating an internal problem in an effort to meet an international one. So what did he mean by that? <clears throat> well, he was concerned that Canada was becoming too mixed, ethnically mixed, and that mixed societies uh, had caused trouble in Europe. And in this, I think we can uh, infer his reading of World War I, which after all was uh, the catalyst for the start of World War I was um, uh, nationalist movements within, a multi, within multinational empires, right? It was the assassination, assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in uh, Sarajevo as a, you know, a mark of rebellion against the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So these kinds of thoughts uh, haunted him. He was also though very much concerned with straining relations between the provinces. If he were to accept Jews, um, you know, he was sensitive to the widespread anti-Semitism in Canada, and he didn't want to uh, lose votes or cause uh, a rift between the provinces and uh, the Federation if he were to allow in numbers of, of Jewish refugees. <clears throat> Following Kristallnacht, though, it appears that King truly was moved by the violence of that uh, pogrom. And that event uh, coincided with him attending the funeral for the uh, wife of one of his MPs. It was uh, Abraham Heaps from Winnipeg. His wife had died. It was right around the time of Kristallnacht. And 
heaps happened to be Jewish. Uh, King attended the funeral and at this service, the rabbi delivered an address that uh, spoke about the situation of the Jews in Europe. And King returned from that service feeling that Canada had to do something. He wrote, quote, I will fight for it as right and just and Christian. And a few weeks later, this was when the proposal arrived uh, to accept 10,000 Jewish refugees. Um, but we see here other concerns come back to uh, the fore. He was worried about unemployment in Canada. He writes, we must consider them first. He also writes about avoiding strife within Canada and respecting the views of his constituents. Now, overall, one cannot accuse King of the same anti-Semitism that shaped the decisions uh, of Blair. At the same time, his sympathy for the Jews was not so strong or so lasting as to change policy in any positive way. For King, the Jewish refugee crisis was not a top priority issue. You look at the December 1938 diary entry, and here he's discussing this proposal to accept uh, 5,000 Jews, 10,000 Jews. Two paragraphs later, he's moved on to writing about tariffs on tea in India, and it gives the sense that this was just one more issue among many that uh, crowded his thinking in those months. King's priority was to put Canadian stability first, and he overall tended to concede to the wishes of the provinces. <clears throat> so then, you know, expanding further our perspective, what was it with the provinces? Why were those relations so volatile? Why was the Jewish refugee issue so sensitive? Now, as a native Quebecer, uh, as the daughter of a French Canadian, um, this part of the story always uh, pains me. I mean, this whole story as a Canadian is, is painful, but it's even more so as, as a Quebecer. Relations between Quebec and the rest of Canada were uh, tenuous. The majority in the province were French Canadian and Catholic. They wanted equal rights for their language and religion, and they did not necessarily see themselves or their interests uh, as, <clears throat> accurately represented or steadfastly defended at the federal level. In the 1920s, Quebec was an industrial manufacturing powerhouse for Canada, yet money and power tended to remain in the hands of Anglophones who were a minority in Quebec. And this uh, contributed to a deep and lasting resentment. And Quebec provincial politi politics were able to capitalize on resentment towards the federal government. And so the refugee issue fell into this, became part of this already acrimonious atmosphere. Now, on the whole, anti Semitism tended to be more pronounced in Quebec. The Catholic Church was strong there. The Catholic Church has uh, its own tortured heritage of anti Semitism. Uh, in Quebec, there was a xenophobic brand of nationalism that rejected everything that wasn't French and Catholic. And antipathy towards the Jews was born out of uh, political realities as well. In 1931, there were 50,000 Jews in Montreal. This accounted for about 6% of the population. And these Jews competed with uh, French Canadians in small business and commerce. They competed with them in professions. <clears throat> Moreover, Jews tended to assimilate to the English minority, they were federalist, and they influenced the political landscape of the province. In 1936, Maurice Duplessis, head of the right-wing nationalist Union Nationale party, became premier of Quebec, and uh, in doing so, beat out the liberal candidate. It left the liberals in Quebec in disarray. And Duplessis fomented conflict with the federal government. He knew that a large Jewish immigration, or the king knew that a large Jewish immigration uh, would play into Duplessis' hands. This was, you know, uh, a fractious issue that would um, dovetail with the kinds of uh, rhetoric that Duplessis was uh, spreading 
about Quebec and Canadian relations. King wanted the Liberal Party to remain strong in Quebec, and so he uh, listened um, very closely to, depended on the advice of his Quebec Lieutenant Ernest Lapointe for uh, advice and guidance. And so post Kristallnacht, when that proposal arrived to accept 10 Jews, King sought the uh, opinion of Lapointe. He was utterly opposed. He stated this would fatally alienate uh, Quebec from the Liberal Party. In the 1940s, there was this proposal to take in refugees from Spain and Portugal. Canada even went so far as to set up an office in Lisbon. It looked like this was going to uh, actually happen. Yeah. Authorities hoped that the, the small number of proposed refugees, remember it was only 250, that this would be enough to satisfy the advocates, right, to sort of quell the constant pressure on the Canadian government to accept refugees, but was still small enough that it wouldn't provoke opponents to this idea. But they were wrong in this. <clears throat> in his 1944 campaign, Duplessis appealed to anti-Semitism. He talked about a refugee invasion, and he declared that the government planned to settle 100,000 Jewish refugees in Quebec. Of course, this was false, but this was something that he uh, spoke about and, and emphasized, knowing that it would um, it would galvanize opinion against the federal government. Of course, it sparked a rash of anti-refugee petitions and it helped Duplessis win the election. Now, anti-Semitism uh, was not the monopoly of uh, Quebec. <clears throat> it was prevalent in English Canada as well. There were quotas on Jews on how many could attend uh, universities, medical schools, you know, serve on boards of, of industries. Jews were restricted from buying property in some areas, from attending certain resorts, from joining private clubs, from sitting on the boards of uh, charitable, educational, and financial organizations. Anti-Semitism was visible in, in newspapers, politics, churches, businesses. There was some anti-Semitic violence in, in Winnipeg, in Toronto, the Christie Pitts riots. <clears throat> and King feared that admitting refugees would cost him electoral support, not just in Quebec, but also in the rest of Canada. Um, one of the uh, best books on this whole question is um, called None is Too Many by Abella and Troper. And they write, most Canadians seemed indifferent to the suffering of German Jews and hostile to admitting some of them to Canada, most Canadians. Yet another factor at play was the depression. <clears throat> In 1933, 32% of Canadian wage earners were unemployed, 15% were dependent on welfare relief. There was some improvement in the later 1930s in manufacturing and mining, but agriculture, construction, the railways, they lagged behind. Authorities, Canadian government authorities and regular Canadian citizens alike assumed that refugees would invariably become a financial burden, a public financial burden. And there was this question, you know, if Canada can't support its own, quote unquote, its own, how are they supposed to support dispossessed newcomers? The other argument at this time was that refugees would steal uh, precious jobs away from the, quote unquote, native born by working for less pay. This is an argument that <clears throat> seems never to entirely go away. And so in any case, given this atmosphere, it's perhaps not surprising that uh, restrictions on immigration were um, carried out uh, without controversy. It's helpful to think about <clears throat> 19th and 20th century Canadian immigration policy in general. This had always been ethnically selective and economically self-serving. Immigration was seen as a function of labor needs. It was significant that the immigration department was housed <clears throat> within the Ministry of Mines and Resources. In the early part of the 20th century, the economy was expanding and the policy was more generous. Also, there was a perceived need to um, populate uh, the West, you know, for fear of uh, the US annexing our West. Between 1900 and 1930, Canada took in 4.5 million immigrants, <clears throat> many of them 
directed towards mining, the lumber industry, farming, prevalent among the immigrants were Ukrainians, Poles, Italians, Asians. They were often used for more dangerous and uh, backbreaking work, laying railway lines and mining. The history of our treatment of Chinese workers is uh, particularly shameful, as I'm sure you know. Immigration policy was also shaped by Canadian self-identity at the time. <clears throat> there was the idea that Canada should privilege its settler British heritage. There was a fear that arrivals would not, new arrivals would not assimilate. Many groups were unwelcome in Canada, American Blacks, Asians. We had a, quote unquote, it was called the continuous uh, journey regulation. Arrivals could not have stopped anywhere on, on route to Canada. And it was implemented in order to choke off immigration from places like India because there were no uh, boats that made a, a single journey, uninterrupted journey. The 1930s too, many forms of uh, prejudice were considered normal and acceptable. There was the uh, practice of restrictive covenants. Technically this was about limiting land use so as not to devalue adjoining properties, but in practice um, agreements were struck between uh, homeowners or business owners not to sell or rent property to this or that minority group. And this was, it was common, it was uh, socially accepted and was in place until the 1950s. Open job discrimination uh, was common in banks and insurance and trust companies. Retail companies would not knowingly hire Jews, Ukrainians or Poles. They tended to be uh, pushed towards <clears throat> rough manual labor jobs. It was a different Canada. It brings us to the last uh, factor to consider <clears throat> as you know, what was shaping Canadian immigration policy and that is Canada's attitudes towards international obligations and, and human rights. And you know, I say the word human rights, the convention did not, uh, the United Nations Convention on Human Rights was still in the future. This uh, didn't come into place until 1948, but ideas about uh, humanitarian obligations or moral obligations to people outside our borders. That's what I'm referring to when I use the term human rights. At this point in Canada's political development, the guiding ideas were, you know, to take care of our own first. And then even within Canada, there was this obviously a hierarchy of stratification of society, you know, of those people to whom we felt we had any obligation. But moral obligations such as they were didn't, um, as a matter of course, extend beyond our national borders. There was no commonly felt obligation to accept a foreign national in trouble. Canada had no refugee policy in the 1930s. Today, Canada accepts approximately 250,000 immigrants and refugees per year, but the concept was not uh, part of the thinking in the 1930s. This idea that a multicultural society being a positive, right? The, the mosaic versus the melting pot. This was something that only came about in the 1960s and 70s. So 1930s, Canada was, was very different, different values. It had a different perception of its role in the world. And I say this not as, as an excuse or as justification, but only by way of helping us understand the decisions that were made. It's important to recognize that many of the factors that shaped Canada's response to the refugee crisis were larger than, they predated and they persisted beyond the appeals of Jews for asylum. And we must also keep in mind that no single factor accounts entirely for Canada's policy decisions. It wasn't just about the depression. It wasn't just about Quebec. It wasn't just about knee-jerk anti-Semitism. It was instead a much more uh, complex constellation of conditions that produced the answers that Canada gave. To understand these factors in no way mitigates Canada's shameful and regrettable response to Jewish refugees, but it does give us a more nuanced appreciation of how and why our government behaved as it did.
the fact that precious few nations <clears throat> proved themselves willing to intervene for the Jews may have sent a message to the Nazis that they were free to do as they pleased, that no protest would be offered. And so we own some of that responsibility. Abella and Tropa, uh, Troper, <clears throat> again, the authors of that, that book, None is Too Many, they write this, one fact transcends all others. The Jews of Europe were not so much trapped in a whirlwind of systematic mass, mass murder as they were abandoned to it. There is a poignant postscript to this story. <clears throat> Auschwitz-Birkenau was the epicenter of the Holocaust. It was purpose-built to enslave and murder Jews from all over Europe. 1.1 million Jews from France to Greece, from Holland to Poland and beyond perished there. Deportees arrived with their most valuable belongings. As in most cases, they had been told that they would be resettled in the East in order to work for the German war, uh, war effort. Most of the arrivals were instead sent uh, to the gas chambers. Their belongings were sorted and stored in large warehouses before being sent back to the Reich to benefit Germany. These warehouses were referred to by camp personnel and the prisoners who worked in them as the Canada barracks because our country was thought to be a land of plenty. That may have been true but our gates remain closed until the war ended. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Hebert, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation. I am, uh, you know, it's, I think it's time for everyone who's, um, who's participating uh, to give a round of applause, even in your own house. That was very excellent. And I'm, um, you know, very thought provoking. Uh, I'm, I, I feel uncomfortable, which is how you want to feel when you're learning history, is that it's, uh, you know, it's inspiring uncomfortable thoughts and that you, uh, you know, you really have to evaluate and, uh, and have discussions. And I think this is one of those, uh, one of those presentations that does that. So thank you so much. Um, so for everyone who's um, still on, uh, on the uh, Zoom here, please do use the question and answer function or the chat box to, uh, to pose questions. For Dr. Hebert, I'm going to um, start moderating those now. So please do type those in. Um, so we do already have one question in. Um, so this one says, uh, my father was 17 when he escaped Holland when the Nazis invaded. He was living with his parents who were Jewish refugees from Germany. They were murdered in Auschwitz. He arrived in Canada and was put in a POW camp for two years. How many Jews were in Canadian POW camps and were Canadians okay with that? Unfortunately, that's not a question I know the answer to. Um, I, I'm, I'm implying from the question that he was brought over during the war and then imprisoned here, still while the war was going on. Uh, it, it appears. It appears that's the. That's the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, my colleague, Michel Beaulieu, has, has written a book about uh, a POW camp of Germans. Um, uh, and, you know, if he were here, perhaps he, he could speak also to the internment of uh, Jewish national, you know, Jewish um, nationals who, who were brought to Canada and in turn that way. Unfortunately, it's not something I can speak to. Um, so Valerie, um, the asker of that question would like to, it looks like they raised their hand to speak. Are you okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. All right, well, let's try that out. Uh, Martha, if you can, um, you're, you're allowed to speak right now. Yeah, sorry, uh, thank you. I enjoyed the presentation very much. Yeah, my father uh, talked about how um, how it long it took can Canadian prisoner uh, prisons, like the prison guards themselves and the administrators of those uh, prisons in Canada, they didn't distinguish between Nazis and Jews. And he tells yeah. stories of you know uh, how 
how it, long it took Canadians to figure out they were putting Nazis in with Jews in some of these <clears throat> camps. And so there really wasn't much understanding from what I could tell from his stories. And certainly he was in prisoner of war camp with many other Jews. So I was just curious about the numbers and how little awareness there was around that. He's written his stories and I know there are other books written about those experiences, but I never got the sense for the numbers. Anyway, I just wanted to say I really appreciated your uh, lecture. It was very good. Thank you. You know, it, it it doesn't surprise me, um, just given the kinds of responses that were made, particularly after the war began, that you know anyone of German heritage, Jewish or not, was now to be considered, uh, you know, an, an enemy national, and that to bring a German Jewish refugee, you know, raised fears of them, you know, spying for Nazi Germany. It seems so ludicrous to us now, but I mean, it's entirely in keeping with the experience your father had being in prison side by side with those who. <laughs> Um, were no friends of his, <clears throat> you know, shared only a country of, of heritage and nothing more. I mean, we know too, we interned um, Italians and Japanese here, right, for the same kinds of reasons. So this, you know, a lack of, of any kind of nuanced understanding and, and gross assumptions of what, about what people's political loyalties were resulted in all kinds of harm to innocent people. Dr. Hibera. Uh, yeah, it looks like there's a uh, discussion going on in the chat and um, looks like somebody uh, mentioned that uh, the exhibit, um, or if they remember correctly, that the exhibit at the museum implies that there were about 2,300 Jews that were in internment camps. Um, but they said they're not that, it, they're not exactly sure on that answer from the exhibit, but that sounds about right. I think there were, um, in the Thunder Bay area, I think I'm aware that there were a couple hundred um, uh, imprisoned in a, in a camp not too far from the Thunder Bay area, which is, um, uh, which I, I'm trying to remember the name of that. Maybe somebody can uh, post that in the chat. We can, uh, we can add that to our discussion. Um, oh, okay. That, so, so somebody's saying that is uh, Red, Rat, Red Rock Camp R is where that took place. That's, that was the name I was trying to recall before. <clears throat> um, all right, uh, so are there any other questions um, there? If you do have some, please do enter those into the uh, Q&A function. Um, so, uh, okay, so here, here we have another question. Um, was there propaganda in Canada, similar to that we see in Nazi Germany, of Jews which amplified the, ampli or I'm sorry, similar to what we've seen in Nazi Germany of Jews, which was amplified the anti-Semitic views? Um, we unfortunately have uh, our own history of uh, fascism in Canada. Adrian Arcand's movement, the uh, was it the Unity Party, the National Unity Party. Adrian Arcand, he um, you know, called himself the Führer of Canada, and you know built a movement based on the same kinds of, of uh, ideological principles that you know. Uh, you know, endorsed, you know, race doctrine and a hierarchy of races and, um, you know, anti-Semitism was part and parcel of that, uh, of that movement. I was going to, I, I guess, follow up question for me on that. Is there more, do we see that um, played out in uh, the print media and the news, um, newspapers at the time? Is there, is there a dialogue about this or is it kind of, um, kind of non-existent, kind of pushed under the rug? critique of Nazi ideology, do you mean? Well, no, more, it... more, more around, um, you know, kind of anti-Semitism and the government policies related to immigration. Anti-Semitism was, was uh, woven into the fabric of society and politics that, you know, it was, it was um, common and commonly accepted that Jews were, uh, you know, not part of Canadian society, right? I mean, restrictions on clubs they could join, on um, their numbers in, in universities and professional schools. Montreal, where I'm from, um, has a Jewish general hospital because our hospitals wouldn't hire, they wouldn't, they wouldn't hire uh, graduates from, Jewish graduates from medical schools. And so they, with, you know, community uh, funding and support, 
built their own hospital in order that their people could actually practice there. Um, and so, you know, it, an editorial cartoon here or there was not the linchpin of this kind of, of thinking and the kinds of actions that, that followed from that thinking. It was very much just uh, part of the everyday. So um, we have another uh, comment here from uh, Deborah Gold, um, just for everyone who's looking for maybe some further reading. Uh, she mentions that uh, the Little Third Reich on Lake Superior, a history of the Canadian internment camp R, is available at the Lakehead University Library. Um, yeah, so, that's the one that Michelle Beaulieu worked on. Right, um, and was, I believe, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, so another question has come in. Um, so could you say anything about how awareness in Canadian Jewish community about treatment of Jewish refugees in those times has impacted the Jewish community's current involvement with Canadian refugee policy and support for refugees? In other words, how does the history you spoke about inform the present Jewish community's relationship to similar issues today? Um, <clears throat> it's not something I can speak to in detail. Um, you know, there, one of the issues at the time was the, um, splintered nature of the Jewish community in Canada. You know, this is something that Abella and Troper discuss in their book that there were, there was a mix of opinions and um, approaches. And so there wasn't a, you know, a, a single vision about what needed to happen, a single voice that, you know, was meeting with, or that was speaking to the Canadian government and asking. On the other hand, I mean, any amount of unity at that time. I mean, clearly this was a, a hostile immigration policy, a hostile administration responding to it. So, you know, Jews at the time were stuck in this impossible position of, um, you know, needing to be a voice for uh, Jewish refugees in crisis, but then also being told not to be too loud about it, right? I mean, it was sort of like this, you know, magical, in you know, imaginary point that that they were you know being made to try and strike when when the you know rules were stacked against them at every turn um how you know canada's refugee policy in general was still very slow to evolve even post-war the un passed a convention on refugees in um believe it's 1951 and it wasn't until the late 60s that Canada actually acceded to the convention and this after a Canadian chaired the you know the committee that came up with this United Nations policy it wasn't until the 1970s with the admission of um, about 120,000 Vietnamese between 19 you know mid 70s to early 80s this was the uh, largest Canadian humanitarian undertaking, you know, until that point. And so, um, you know, the, the idea even that there is this sort of sea change in attitudes towards uh, immigration on the part of Canada is, is um, post-war as a lesson of, of World War II is, is not necessarily true. Okay, well, um, we don't have any questions in the hopper right now. Does anyone have any more they would like to ask? Please do use that Q&A function or the, uh, the chat box to please enter those in. If, uh, if not, I'll uh, do some um, closing uh, or some wrap up comments here. Uh, and if you do have some more questions, we can, uh, we can catch those um, in between all of that. So I... Um, would like to uh, also acknowledge the uh, Thunder Bay Museum's uh, partnership with the Thunder Bay Public Library. Uh, while we have an exhibit in our galleries, they have put together um, special collections and displays within each of their uh, library branches where folks can explore more uh, literature and, and uh, historical uh, books and documents um, related to the Holocaust. And uh, you can explore this history further with the Thunder Bay Public Library. Um, 
uh, and following this, uh, the Thunderbeam Museum has several more events um, so in support of the traveling exhibit end in 1948, I came to Canada, the Holocaust in six dates. So on the 10th, 11th, and 12th of May, we have three concerts going on. Um, they're titled A Song Rings Out, Lost Composers of the Holocaust. So the same concert each night. They'll be led by um, Michelle Zaff Bellinger from the Thunder Bay Symphony Orchestra. And they'll be featuring, um, featuring some excellent music each of those nights. So tickets are available through the museum's website, or you can email info at thunderbaymuseum.com for more information. Uh, then on the 19th of May, we have um, a lecture for our schools by uh, Child of Holocaust Survivors, Mark Scharf, and that'll be taking place at 1230. Um, registration information for that also available on the museum's website. And then that same evening at 730, uh, Mr. Mark Scharf will be giving another lecture to the Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society in that evening for those of us who work during the day. Um, so, uh, I would like to um, again thank the uh, Shari Shemayam congregation for their financial and intellectual support, uh, and as well as uh, special thank yous to Dr. Daryl Hanna, or Daniel Hanna, Dr. Charles Levoque, uh, doc, Dr. Deborah Scharf, and Mitch Goldenberg, and Michelle Zaff Bellinger for their, their contributions and their assistance in planning uh, for the exhibit and all of the programming going along with it. I would also like to thank the museum staff and volunteers for their hard work on the exhibit and for support of the programming. So um, thank you to everyone for attending tonight. Merci, Che Megwich.